Thank you for listening to Freedom Church Online. Please stay tuned for a powerful word from God. We would love to have you worship with us in person, Sundays at 1045 a.m. at 701 Harwood Road in Bedford. Until then, sit back and enjoy this word. Uh, we're, we're, we're in a series called Confessions, or These Are My Confessions. And last week, I thank God for Jennifer Todd. Come on, y'all give God some praise for her. For taking the time to open up the series in a relevant and and, and, uh, transparent way to let you know that sometimes she loses hope. I don't know if you can relate to that, but I do too. Sometimes, sometimes I, I, I don't feel the hope that I should. The Bible says that it's Christ in us, the hope of glory. So it's not how I feel, it's who he is. And he is Christ in you, the hope of Glory. We want to continue this series because the Bible says in James chapter number five that we ought to confess to one another so that we can be healed. The Bible says that if we confess our sins to one another, we can be healed. If we confess to the Lord, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. When we confess to the Lord, he transforms us and changes us. When we confess to the Lord, he makes a way for us to come back to the Father. But when we begin to confess to one another, here's what happens. The doors open for our healing. Many of us have been hurt. Many of us are hurting. Many of us have hurt people. Many of us are trapped in certain situations and places spiritually, emotionally, physically, intellectually, vocationally, financially, simply because we keep our mouths shut. And the reality is one of the worst things that you can do, one of the worst uh, practices that you can have is one of isolation. And when the enemy can keep your mouth closed, he can keep your hand closed. And when he keeps your hand closed, he'll keep you from receiving everything that God has for you. See, the position of confession is a posture of receiving. When I lift up my hands in surrender, I'm also receiving what it is God has for you. For me. And so in this series, we want to confess. We want to, we want to open up our mouths. This is my therapeutic opportunity to share with you things that go on in my heart. This is my opportunity to be transparent with you as the people of God and the, the, the church and the family here at Freedom for me to say, hey guys, this is what I'm dealing with. This is what I think about. These are the things I'm struggling with in hopes that my transparency will trigger something in you that leads you to a place of transparency, that leads you to your place of freedom. And so in this series, we, we, we have talked about hope as a confession. Today, I want you to turn to 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter number 19. And when you get there, I want you to look at verse number 9. Verse number 9. I'm only going to read at this moment verse number 9 in your hearing. That's where we'll gain our title from. So when you get there, I want you to shout at me. Shout amen when you got it. Shout amen at shout amen at me when you got it. If you need some more time, say hold up. Wait a minute. It's all good. I still hear pages turning. Uh, I want us to get ready. I want us all to read this together. I woke up at one o'clock in the morning like a kid on Christmas ready to preach this message. So I'm excited. I don't know if you're excited, but I'm excited. I can tell the people that are excited, they pull on me because they're expecting something from God. They realize that the word of God is not something that comes from a man's mouth, but it's something that comes through a man's mouth from God to them. I I wish there were some expectant people in the house today. Amen. 1 Kings chapter number 19, verse number 9, and it says, There he came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Verse number nine again. There he came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? One more time, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. There he came to a cave and lodged in it, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? If I can just have your attention for a few more minutes, I want to talk from this topic. Uh, This is my confession. I get comfortable in the cave. I, I get comfortable 
in the cave. Uh, I don't know about you, but but uh, I I am the type of person that likes to to to, to fall asleep on the couch. Uh, there are some of you who need it to be completely dark. You need to be completely silent. I like to have a little bit of noise around me when I'm falling asleep. I don't know if that's something that's wrong with my mind, if that's something that's going on with me that's not good, but I tend to fall asleep. We can have company over. We can be hanging out. Matter of fact, it happened last night. We have folks over to the house. I'm sitting on the couch. It's about 9.30. Everybody's talking. The TV's going. Everybody's moving. I get in my little spot on the couch. I got a spot right in that corner. You know what the, you know what the spot is. Everybody has that spot. I get in that spot, and I get comfortable in that spot, and, and here's what happens. All that stuff that's going on around me, it literally is like a lullaby to me. It sings me straight to sleep. And in mid-conversation, if you're talking to me, I might doze straight off. I, I, I might lose all my focus and not hear anything you're saying. Matter of fact, there are several times when my wife and I are talking and she said, I, I just want, uh, she's like, oh, she's telling me about her day or she's telling me something that's happening. And then all of a sudden, what I've, I've dozed off, but I know uh, that I've dozed off when she says, never mind. It's like, it's like, never mind, it's an alarm clock to me, and it wakes me up. And I say, no, 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 I'm listening. She say, what did I say? And I try to recall the last thing she says, and I mesh it together with what it is that I thought I heard her say and the dream that I was having. And I say, you know, I, I got you. You was talking about what was happening with the kid and how he wasn't acting right. And then you try to put the context clues together and, and, and try to piece this thing. I wish she was working in children's uh, church today so I didn't have to... Admit my secret. This, I guess it's a confession series. We're going to confess. I might as well. If, if I'm going to tell it, then I got to tell it all. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, so, so there are times when, when, I, when I just doze off. But, but I find myself in that comfortable spot on my couch, Brandon. And it's a comfortable spot for me. And it's where I love to fall asleep. As a matter of fact, I don't necessarily love to fall asleep. I've come to the place now where it's almost like my body automatically just does it. It's the comfortable place. It's my comfort spot. It's, it's my spot on the couch. And when I fall asleep there, uh, it, it is good for me temporarily, but ultimately it's not the best position for me to fall asleep in. There have been times when I fell asleep in my comfortable spot and woke up with my back hurting. There have been times when I fell asleep in my comfortable spot and I got a crick in my neck. There have been times when I fell asleep in my comfortable spot and missed an opportunity to spend time with my baby in the bed. For the grown folks, send your children to children's church next time. (laughs) That there have been times when I've fallen asleep in my comfortable spot and missed out on something greater than what I settled for in my comfort. There have been times when I get into my comfort zone and my comfort spot and I wake up and ask myself, why do you keep doing this to yourself? You know it's no good for you. There are times when I get into my comfort spot and and when I wake up, I I have to interrupt my sleep because I'm not as comfortable as I was when I first fell asleep. And so now I got to get up, go to the bed, readjust myself, get back to sleep when I should have just ended up in the bed in the first place. What are you talking about, Pastor, about falling asleep? All of you have a comfort spot. Maybe, maybe it's your physical comfort, but immediately some of you went to your comfort spot in your life. There are some places in your life that you're comfortable. There are some places in your life where, where, where you're stagnant. There are some places in your life where, where when you go there, watch this, you get rest temporarily, but there's pain that comes out of it. There, there are some comfort spots in your life. Maybe it's a comfort spot in your marriage. Maybe it's a comfort spot on your job. Maybe it's a comfortable spot in your relationship with the Lord where you're comfortable for a temporary season, but it's not producing any eternal value. It's not producing anything that's going to last in the long run. It's not producing anything that's going to produce anything for the long term. And I'm here to challenge today some people's comfort places. In, In life, there are places that we go that are comfortable, that there are caves of comfort that we tend to hang out in, caves of comfort that we tend to to enjoy, caves of comfort that that we have created where we run to when life gets hard. Because each and every one of us, listen to me, we seek our own comfort. When when things make us uncomfortable, we don't don't naturally want to confront it. We go to our comfort place. When we get uncomfortable, we don't naturally look for resolution or solution. We look for something to make us comfortable. This is why so many of us are medicating ourselves with social media or medicating ourselves with alcohol or medicating ourselves with, with, with sex or medicating ourselves with, 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 with uh, affirmation from other people. We're looking to medicate ourselves to get comfortable 
because we refuse to deal with what's in front of us. And so in this particular text, the Bible says that Elijah runs to a cave on Mount Horeb. And the Bible says not only does he run to the cave, but there he comes to a cave and he lodges in it. He sets up his bed. He falls asleep in this cave. He, he, he set up residence in the cave. He's, he set up an address. He's forwarded all of his homies and his friends and told them, don't look for me at my old address. I got a new address. I'm in the cave now. He, said, he says, when, when you come searching for me now, don't write me a letter where I used to be. Write a letter at the cave. He moved from the brook to the widow's house to the mountain, now to the cave. That Elijah is now lodging in a comfortable place, but this comfortable place is not where God had called him. And so in this uh, confession series, I want to deal with three things that I see in this text that deal with me personally when I get comfortable in the cave and what that looks like and what it means, and I pray that you can relate as well so that this can be a blessing to you, then also I want to show us how to come out. I don't want to just talk to us about being in the cave because several times we are in the cave and we don't see any light, no pun intended, at the end of the tunnel. And really what I want to do is I want to challenge some of you out of your cave. I want to call you out of your cave and into your calling. And so, so if you're taking notes with me today, the first thing I want you to see is that this cave that Elijah finds himself in is a cave of cowardice. It's a cave of cowardice. When you look at 1 Kings chapter 19, uh, verses 1 through, four, through 3, excuse me, here's what it says. It says, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. It makes sense in a minute. I'll tell you about what happened. Then he was afraid, and he rose and ran for his life to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. Elijah gets the question while he's in this cave, Elijah, what are you doing here? Well, why are you in the cave? And when I find myself comfortable in the cave, I find myself hearing the Lord asking me the same question. Robert, what are you doing here? Which means I'm out of position. Yeah. Which means I'm not in the place in which God called me. Every time in the story of Elijah, when Elijah ended up somewhere, it was because the word of the Lord sent him. When he, when he, in chapter number 17, comes on the scene with no background, unknown, we don't know where he's from, what his qualifications are, who his daddy and him are, what neighborhood he come from, where his pedigree was, degrees that he had. We don't know anything except for the fact that Elijah shows up on the scene and the Lord told him to go talk to the king. After that, there's a famine in the land. Elijah is told to go to the brook. After that, the brook dries up. Elijah is told to go to the widow's house. After that, the Bible says he's told to talk to Obadiah in the field. After that, he's told to show down with the prophets on Mount Carmel. Everywhere Elijah has gone prior to this point, God had told him where to go. But when he gets to the cave, it's the place of his own comfort. There are some of us who are living in a place of our own comfort. God has not called you there, but you're comfortable. God, God has not assigned this place to you, but you're comfortable. And you got to be careful when you find yourself in a comfortable place that God hasn't called you to. you got to be careful that you're in a comfortable place, that you're living in a, in a position where everything seems fine to you, but you're not living out what God called you to. The Bible says, woe to those who are at ease in Zion. When you find yourself in a comfortable place, I'm not talking about joy. I'm not talking about a place where I'm content. I'm not talking about a place where I'm excited about where I am and what God has done in my life. I'm talking about when there's a challenge before me, but I back away from it because I want to be comfortable. I'm talking about where there's an enemy out there who's trying to stop me from getting everything that God wants me to get. And instead of opposing him and resisting him so that he flees the way the scripture tells me he will, I back up and go back to what I'm used to. Be careful when you're in the cave of comfort, because this cave is a cave of cowardice. Elijah was on the run from Jezebel when he gets to this cave. She threatens to kill him, as you just read in the text. But, but it's an odd thing for me, because Elijah had just experienced so many miracles from the Lord. 
I'm talking about two chapters of miracle after miracle after miracle. I don't know that there's another jam-packed two chapters in the Bible that share all of the things that Elijah has experienced. He's afraid for his life and runs to the cave. But after all God has done for you, Elijah, after all God has shown you, Robert, How do you end up in the cave of cowardice? How do you end up in a cave afraid for your life? In chapter 17, I just told you that Elijah shows up on the scene and he speaks to Ahab and says, at my word, watch this, it's not going to rain. And guess what? It didn't rain. It's a miracle. I dare one of you to go outside today and speak to the gray clouds and tell them, it ain't going to rain anymore till I say so. And everybody at 7-Eleven is going to be like, who is this fool? (laughs) But Elijah steps out and he says, at my word, it's not going to rain anymore until I say so. And for three and a half years, no rain. This, this is what Elijah experienced. He experienced that his obedience to God produced the miracles of God. That when he opened up his mouth and spoke, no rain came down from heaven. Not only, not only do we see in chapter 17 this miracle of, of, of Elijah speaking and the rain not coming, God then, I told you, sends him to the brook. The miracle of this is there is no food in the land. There is no water in the land, but God takes Elijah to a special brook and feeds him by ravens. Ravens, by nature, are selfish animals. But God says every day they're going to drop meat on you. They're going to drop bread on you. Here you go, Elijah. You can eat. It was the miracle that he was experiencing based on the obedience that he had given. After the brook dried up, God says, I want to take your faith to another level. I don't have time to go into this. But then he ends up in a widow's house. We preached this about three or four weeks ago. He ends up at a widow's house. He says, there I've commanded her to feed you, Elijah. This widow had nothing. She was getting ready to prepare a meal for her and her son, and she had resolved that they would die. But God says to Elijah, go there and eat food. And here's what he does to the widow. He says, bake me a cake, and let's watch us all live. And God saw, showed him another miracle of provision vision in the midst of the famine. Here is another miracle. The woman's son dies and Elijah stretches himself out, calls on the name of the Lord and the woman's son comes back to life. Elijah is experiencing miracle after miracle after miracle. That's just chapter 17. Elijah goes into chapter 18, comes back to to, to the place where he sees Obadiah, his his partner, the one who's hiding the prophets, and says, go tell Ahab that I need to holler at him. He goes and gets Ahab, and he tells him, hey, it's going to rain, Ahab. You ready? Ahab says, yeah. Here's what happens. Watch this. Uh, 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 Excuse me. Before that, he says, says, how long are you going to waver between two opinions, Israel? He says, I need to know if you're going to serve God or you're going to serve Baal. So he calls the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah. He calls them to a duel on Mount Carmel. He says, hey, I'm just going to teach you this. You, you got to go home and read it in detail for yourself. He says, if your God is God, then let him call down fire from heaven. And, he sa- and they said, and, and, and do it on the altar. They cut themselves. They pray. They chant. They do all of these things, and their God never shows up. Elijah, mocking them, says, maybe your God's in the bathroom. We'll wait on him. That's how some of y'all need to start responding to these people who don't believe in what it is that you believe. That when you see that you know and you expect God is getting ready to come through and they're waiting on some other fanciful thing in their life, they're going to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. They're going to do it the old American way. You need to look at them and say, maybe your God is in the restroom because as I see what's happening in our world today, that stuff don't work. But if you call on the name of the Lord, people can be saved and transformed. Here's the thing. Elijah then puts water on the altar, soaks it down. Make sure that they understand this ain't no trick or no gimmick. Your God, watch this, didn't warm up the altar for mine. He says, I'm going to pour water on the altar so that you understand and and know that this thing right here is going to be a miracle. And he calls on the God of heaven. And as soon as he calls on the God of heaven, the Bible says fire comes down and licks up all of the water. Then after that, here's what happens. Elijah says to his servant, go run up the mountain and go look for the clouds. The servant goes and looks and he comes back and he says, I hear the sound of the abundance of rain and it rains. After all of this time, Elijah has experienced 
the miracles of God. He has silenced the voice of the prophets. But one voice, one threat, one thing in the opposite direction of what God had called him to has sent him spinning in a tailspin, and now he don't know what to do. You, you look at Elijah and you say, Elijah, how could you do such a thing? How could you live like that? What's up? Can I, be, can I confess? I live just like Elijah. Yeah, I live just like Elijah. After all the blessings that God has given me financially, after the bills that he paid when I didn't have the money to pay him, after the raises he gave me when I didn't deserve them, after the times he provided through people and opportunities that I didn't know were coming, here's the thing. If a bill comes that I didn't expect and it's double what I think, I automatically retreat to my cave. Come on, somebody. You going to leave me out here by myself? That the reality is... At all of the time when I saw that God was a healer, I saw him do it for other people. I've seen him do it in my own life. He could heal my mind. He could heal my soul. He could heal my body. But let the doctor tell me something. Let my body respond awkwardly to something. I began to look up and say, well, God, I guess this is it. After all that I've experienced with the Lord, sometimes I still get scared of one voice. Every sermon that I preach, every life that God has changed, all the evidence of God's hand on my life in this church seems to be erased with one word of a critic or one rogue person who decides to come in and say, I don't like what you're doing. I decide to run to the cave. And here's what the Lord told me. Run no more. Remember next time. And I'm here to tell somebody in the room today, run no more. Remember next time. When the enemy comes up to you and tells you that he's going to threaten you and he's going to take you out, I need you to understand running is not your answer. Remembering is your solution. You can't run away from what it is that God is doing. God called you to confront that devil, not run from him. I I got a problem with the text because Jezebel says this. Watch. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, which means she heard about what happened on Carmel. She heard that the prophets of Baal had been put to death, and the ones for Asherah, they, they, they were so scared, they just ran. They didn't, get, they didn't have time to get put to death. They had to run. And now, watch this. Here's Jezebel's. Je- these people got killed for a God who didn't show up for them. And Jezebel's response is, so may the gods do to me And more so also, if I do not make your life as one of them by this time tomorrow. Got a problem with the text, Jezebel. What gods are you talking about? I I got a problem with the text, Jezebel, because those gods were already defeated. Those gods have already lost. It's funny how we'll let the threat of an idol that's already been defeated cause us to doubt the promise of a God who's never lost a battle. I don't understand how it is that we can look at the devil who's been defeated, the devil who's lost every battle, the devil who never wins, and say, if you threaten me, I'll run when God promises us and tells us to resist. God tells you to stand after having done everything else to stand. Stand having girded your loins with truth. What is the truth? That you are a lender and not a borrower. What is the truth? That you are more than a conqueror. What is the truth? That God says, I, you can do all things through Christ. Christ who strengthens you. What is the truth? That if you get in his hand, nobody can snatch you out. You need to hold on to truth and stop believing the lie. Ahab, Jezebel, what gods are you talking about? I promise you, Jezebel didn't know it, but she was prophesying. Watch this. Because Jezebel said, let me read it to you. So may the gods do to me And more so also, if I do not make your life as one of them by this time tomorrow. Now, I think she thought she was saying, if I don't make your life like one of these prophets who got slaughtered. See, I think she was saying, that that, that I think she was thinking she was saying, that you're going to be dead like one of the prophets that got killed on Mount Carmel. But I believe, watch this, she says, "So, so may the gods do to me, and more so if I do not make your life as one of them by this time tomorrow. As one of who? Those prophets were dead. And she was prophesying also that her gods were dead. That that her gods were like them. Her gods were like the slaughtered prophets. They're dead. There is nothing left of them. There is no evidence left of them. Jezebel was prophesying and also prophesying of her own demise. Because eventually Jezebel would die. 
the same way that these other folks died. They would slaughter her and erase everything about her. Here's the reality. Sometimes we get afraid of what somebody's threatening against us when really what they're doing is setting up their own hanging. Come here, Mordecai. Mordecai stood tall and strong and worked against the, uh, the attack of Haman. And when Haman was setting up the gallows for Mordecai to be hung, hung in, here's what happened. It turned around and the same gallows that were set up for Mordecai, Haman hung by him. Let the devil talk. Let him scream at you. Let him tell you what you're not going to do, who you aren't, and where you're not going. Let him set himself up for failure. He's prophesying a blueprint for his own death. Keep talking, devil. I want to see how you're going down. Prophesy to me about how I'm going down. I know I'm more than a conqueror, but you're at least telling me how you plan to die. And so like Elijah, oftentimes we run to the cave of cowardice. I run to the cave because I know that if I go to God, he's not going to give me the response I wanted. He's going to tell me to fight. See, sometimes we want to go to God and he give us the excuse, I'll take care of Jezebel. There is a scripture that says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. But oftentimes he uses you in the process. We have gotten so comfortable in the cave because we're so afraid of confrontation. We've gotten so comfortable in the cave because we're afraid to tell the enemy straight to his face what we believe about our God. And here's what the Lord is saying to you today. You're going to have to deal with Jezebel. You're going to have to deal with Ahab. You're going to have to deal with the people that I've placed in front of you. And it's not really people. It's the spirits that I've placed in front of you. I see this illustrated with my own children. They don't come to me oftentimes because they're afraid of my answer. And so every now and again, I catch them sneaking in the pantry trying to get snacks without permission. Well, what am I talking about? That means that they're going in there. And, and there's some Oreos in the pantry. Or there's some, some, some fruit snacks in the pantry. Y'all that got little kids, y'all know what I'm talking about. Yeah. There, there's some snacks in the pantry. And because they have co-conspired together, that, that it will be okay for them to eat these snacks. That it's not harming anybody. That in between meals, they can do this. And, and nobody will know. It won't hurt anybody. As a matter of fact, the cookies are for them. The adults don't even eat these cookies. We, we don't even eat the goldfish. We don't eat the stuff that they eat. We, we have a different palate than they have. We have, that they don't use sophisticated words like palate. I'm sure they say stuff like that and even theirs. This is our stuff. And parenthetically, if I ever hear them saying, this is ours, I'll write my name on everything in the pantry and put a dollar sign next to it and ask them, how much did you pay? Like the price is right. I'll put a cover over that joker and be like, higher or lower? And if they guess wrong, they'll starve that night. I'm kidding, I wouldn't do that. CPS, I wouldn't do that to my kids. I love them. God bless you in the name of Jesus. But there are times when I catch my kids going into said pantry, getting ready to get what they want. And they're just as comfortable as they want to be just as comfortable as they want to be, opening up the cookies, popping popcorn in my microwave. Like, I can't hear the microwave. Man. And I come out of my room into the kitchen and say, what are you doing in here? And the look on their face is a look of surprise because we thought we were getting away with this. We, we, we thought we could avoid what it is that you would have said if we asked you in the first place. We, we thought we could move in our own strength, in our own wisdom, in our own might. We, we thought we could get this thing done without your permission, make ourselves feel good and just move on. We don't have to alert you, Dad, about what's going on. I've made a decision about what's happening. No matter what you think, I've already made a decision. The problem is you get yourself into more trouble sneaking into the pantry without permission than you do just coming and asking about the message that I would have given you in the first place. Come here, child of God, sneaking into the cave or the pantry of life, trying to go back and fulfill what it is that you want to do and not asking God what he wants you to do. Here's what the Lord says. If you would have asked me, I would have given you not only the solution, but the sources to make it happen. But because you did not ask me, now I got to take you the long way and show you something just to teach you a lesson. It's the cave of cowardice. This boy was afraid of Jezebel and afraid to ask God for help. Don't ever find yourself afraid to ask God for help. 
It is not the desire of our God to abuse you. It is the desire of our God to source you with everything that you need to get the job done. I find myself at times running into places that he never told me to because I'm afraid he might send me in a direction outside of my comfort. It's the cave of cowardice. Not only is it the cave of cowardice, it's the cave of comparison. It's the cave of comparison. Elijah doesn't just run to any old cave. He runs to the cave that is on Mount Horeb. It doesn't mean anything to any of you unless you've read your Old Testament. The Bible says this in verses 4 through 8. He himself went a day's journey. Remember, he got to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, which is where he should have stopped. My Bible readers going to catch me in just a minute. I'm going to let y'all check, 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 check the words in the text. Uh, go back, go back one more verse. Go to verse 3. I'm sorry. Go back to verse 3 real quick. I want to show you something. Then he was afraid. He arose and he ran for his life. That's fine sometimes that you get afraid and you run for your life. But you ran to the right place, but you didn't stay there long enough. He came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah. And he left his servant there. My Bible readers understand that Judah means praise. That had he stayed there just a little bit longer and began to worship God, the perspective of his praise would have erased the perspective of his problems. And he would have been able to take care of what God did. But just like any good movie, if it stopped here, the credits roll, we would have felt like we were cheated out of our money. Verse 4 <laughs> says, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He, he, he voluntarily goes where the Israelites wanted to get out of. You're voluntarily running into places that there are people begging to get out of. You're voluntarily running from the presence of God when there were people who would desire to be in his presence. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree and asked that he might die, saying, it is enough now. Oh, Lord, take away my life, for I'm no better than my father's. That's a key word right there. He says, no, I'm better than my father. He's rehearsing the past, not in a good way. But in a negative way, he should have remembered all the things that God had done for him in his immediate past. But he goes all the way back to where people died in the wilderness and says, I'm no greater than them. Just let me die like they did in the wilderness. And here's what he says. He says, and he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And here's what I love about the Lord, that even in your disobedience, he provides. He says, and behold, an angel touched him and said, arise. And eat. And here's what he didn't do. He didn't say, go hunt, go gather. He says, Elijah, I see you a little bit depressed. I see that the world has gotten you down. I see that, 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 that this is a little bit overwhelming for you. He says, here's what I need you to do. You've gotten some rest. You've gotten some sleep. You know sometimes when you get into a place where, where, where you're just sick with depression, sometimes you just need to lay down. But don't stay down too long. And here's what the angel of the Lord says. It says, arise and eat. And he looked and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. Wait a minute. We just came out of the, we just came out of the story where he got a cake baked for him by the widow and there was, a, it was, a, there was a, a, a shortage of water because of the drought. And here's what the Lord says. I don't care what's going on in the world. I got you. I don't care what's happening on around you. I got you. The Lord says, here's what he does. And he ate the cake and he drank it and he lay down again. And the angel of the Lord said, get you some rest, Elijah. That's fine. Do what you need to do. But don't stay down too long. He says, came again a second time and touched him and said, arise and eat. For the journey is too great for you. Now, the text tells us that he arose and he ate and he drank and he went in the strength of that food 40 days. Here's what happens. He went 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the Mount of God. And some of us have been riding on what God gave us 40 days ago. 40, 40 days is a symbol. 40 days is a symbol. It might not be exactly 40 days, but maybe some of you are eating old food that God gave you from yesterday. Maybe you're living on an old word that God gave you from a while ago. And the reality is you're running and you're running and you're running on an old word. You need new direction. Because if not, you'll find yourself at Horeb. Now, here's what's deceiving. The text says it's Horeb, the Mount of God. That seems like a great place to be. 
that if I'm going to run somewhere, I might as well run to the Mount of God. But in this case, Elijah has run back to a place of the past. This is in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 1 where Moses encountered God. Throw it up on the screen. Now Moses, the Bible says in Exodus chapter 3, 1, was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Here's what Elijah is doing. He's going back to the place of the wilderness. He's reviewing all of the past. He's comparing himself to everything that he's seen and saying, God, after I compare myself to all that I've seen, I'm not worthy to live. Go ahead and kill me. He finds himself, just like some of us do, comparing ourselves to yesterday's prophets, comparing ourselves to somebody else who's had success. Can I be on the confession couch again? Sometimes I look out in the body of Christ and I'm comparing myself to where God has moved. I'm comparing myself to what God is doing. I'm comparing myself to who God is using or who he has used in the past. And here is where uh, uh, Elijah goes wrong. He goes back to Horeb, the Mount of God, not to seek God, but to get Moses' favor. He goes back to, to this mountain to go get somebody else's blessing. He goes back to this place comparing himself and saying, well, if this is where Moses got it, maybe I'll get it here too. Some of us are trapped in a cycle of religion saying that if grandmama got it this way, maybe I'll get it this way too. Some of us are trapped in a cycle of religion looking at somebody who got a blessing and saying, watch this. This is the type of questions we ask people who are on fire for the Lord. Tell me what you did. Tell me what you did to get on fire. Tell me what you did to have this. Tell me what you did. Here's what we're trying to do. We're trying to muster up a routine of religion so that we can get God's approval for us the way that he approved somebody else. And God says, you're not Moses, you're Elijah. I didn't call you to Horeb, I called you to Carmel. And if you keep running from Carmel, you'll miss your opportunity to see God move. Cave of comparison. Maybe if I can just get what Moses had. Can I be honest? I ask myself at night, some of y'all, these names, they're going to mean nothing to you. If I could just get the team Furtick hat. If I could just have the money Morris has. If I could just have the backing that Hodges has. Y'all don't know nothing about this. These are preachers that you look at and you, you, I find myself looking at them and comparing myself to them. You got your own set of people. Don't look at me like I'm crazy. If I could just have so-and-so's marriage. If I could just have so-and-so's job, if my kids would behave like so-and-so's kids, if I could just have so-and-so's position, and we envy what other people have, and that level of comparison only leads to two forms of insecurity. We find ourselves ashamed or apathetic. In this instance, he's comparing himself to Moses, and he finds himself in a place where he's ashamed of what he's performed, looking at Moses, who was brought to the Red Sea by God. And here's he, here he is saying, God, you open up the Red Sea and you drowned Pharaoh while Moses went in the opposite direction. Why do I have to face Jezebel? He wants what Moses had. And the Lord is saying, I'm not giving you what Moses had. I'm calling you to a new thing. And here he is, ashamed, his first response. He runs and he hides into the cave of comparison. God, you did it for Moses. You ought to also do it for me. God, why are you blessing him? Why are you not blessing me? Well, the other side of this insecurity will lead you to a place of apathy. Oh, and that's the next place that Elijah finds himself in. Look at verse 10. The Lord asks him a question while he's in the cave. What are you doing here, Elijah? Here's his response. He says, I came to, to Horeb, and I thought you were going to respond differently, Lord. And you got the nerve to ask me what I'm doing here. You know what you did for Moses here. But since you're not going to answer me, since you're not going to do what I need you to do, here's my response. He goes straight apathetic. He said, I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. God of hosts, uh, 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 understand that's a term of war for God. So the God of hosts is the God who goes before Israel when they get ready to go to war. And here's what he's saying to God. He, he's, he's throwing up God's names, not in a, in a reverential way. But he's throwing up God's name and said, I've been zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, the one who wins battles. And I'm still fighting. Here I am in this cave of comparison. Watch what he says. Watch. He says, he says I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel, comparing himself. This is, this is what I did. I'm, je I'm jealous for the Lord. I'm jealous for the one who fights battle. But those other people. Those other folks that you set your affection on and you love, they've forsaken your covenant. 
They thrown down your altars. They killed your prophet with the sword. And I'm the only one left. And now they even seek my life. God, I've I done all this work for you. And all I get for a thank you is that they want to kill me? Whew. God, I stay up till, I'm going to tell you what the Robert White version is. I stay up till 3, 4 o'clock in the morning studying this word. And all they got for me is rebellion. I'm just being honest. God, God, I, I sacrificed myself. I could be doing something else. I don't need to do this. I'm not with these people. Not in this run in this time. And all they get, all I get is this. And here's what the Lord says. Watch this. The Lord looks at, at, at Elijah. I'm, I'm glad I'm not the Lord. Because that apathetic attitude that you and I oftentimes will take uh, would have me. I'm not talking about the Lord. I'm not the Lord would have me look at you and say, cool then, you're dead. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Lord, I get to go to heaven. No, 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 no. That insult right there is going to take you straight to hell. So you don't get to bypass earth and go to heaven. you straight to hell. That's cool. Like, you want to talk to me like that? That's cool. You know who I am, right? You know my authority, right? You know my position, right? Okay, you got that apathetic attitude toward me? Go to hell. <laughs> but, but I'm not God. But, but I'm not God. Watch this. And God's response to Elijah, or lack thereof, shows his compassion. God's response to Elijah, or his lack thereof, shows his compassion. Before I even get to that, let me remind you that what Elijah is saying in this moment isn't even true. He's saying all of Israel is forsaken the Lord. They torn down the altars, and they're seeking his life. Go back to 1 Kings chapter 18. After the prophets of Baal have been defeated, after they see the miracle of God, after they see what God has done, they create reform. Look at verse 39. And when, what's the next word? Y'all reading it? It's on the screen. It's on the screen? It's on the screen? Maybe, 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 we, maybe me and John are on a different page. Are y'all reading this with me? Y'all reading it with me? I'm going to look at my Bible. Y'all look at the screen or look at your Bible. And when... I'm going to need everybody to say that. Read it with me. Now, now, here's what you do. You do not get a pass on this, okay? You got to read it with me. And when all, all the people saw it, they rebelled against Elijah and said, Nah, brother, you can't be killing our prophets. We're going to kill you. No, nah, brother, you, you, you ain't going to talk disrespectful about Jezebel and Ahab. That's the king. No, nah, Elijah, this ain't how we get down in Israel. You are done. We're going to break down the altar of the Lord. And we, this is what Elijah said they did. We're going to break down the altar of the Lord, and we're going to kill you. You better run. That's not what their response was. Their response says, and when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Yahweh, he is God. Yahweh, he is God. They began to worship. When they saw the work of the Lord in Eli through Elijah, they began to worship. And Elijah said to them, seize the prophets. They even obeyed his word. And here comes Elijah in the next chapter, lying on the people. They don't listen, Lord. They trying to kill me, Lord. The Lord's like, you know I was there, right? You, you know I was there. I saw what happened. There are no more prophets of Baal. Y'all killed them all. And you didn't have to slay a single one of them. The same people you're acute. I'm talking to myself now. Because there are moments when there are people around me who don't believe in what God is doing. There are moments when there are people around me who don't get with what God is putting in my spirit, Xander. But I got to remember and remind myself that there are certain giants I've not had to slay. That God has put people around me who when I begin to speak and prophetically declare what it is that God is doing, they seize the false prophets. They attack the demonic spirit. They go after what it is that's trying to take us out. God, I thank you for a group of people who believe in what it is that you're doing so that we can take the world by force. I'm ready to do it. Elijah didn't have to kill one of them because he had good people around him. He had a Brandon Williams and a Xander Todd, a Marcus Brookings and a French Thompson. He had good people around him. I ain't got to kill certain giants. God gave me good people around me. Amen. But notice God's lack of response. He didn't even address Elijah. He didn't even try to remind him of the names. He could have went down and be like, I ain't even going to try to create an Israelite name. 
Jedediah, son of Akaliah, was there for you on the mountain. He don't do that. Here's what the Lord says. What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah's response. God, go. What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah's response. God's response. Go. What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah's response. God's response. Here's what God is saying. Most of the time when God shows up to our pity parties, he's bringing you the present of perspective. Watch what God says. I didn't call you to this cave, so I'm not going to entertain your excuses and stay in it. <laughs> he says, I didn't call you to the cave, so I'm not going to entertain whatever excuse you have of being here. What are you doing here, Elijah? It's not a question that needs an explanation. It's a question that begs for movement. Yeah. When God says, what are you doing here? He's not looking for you to give him your dissertation about why you feel like the cave is the best place for you to be right now. Well, there's Jezebel, and I've heard that she's too lazy to come to the cave and that it is an abomination for the worshipers of Baal to come to this height. And I've heard that, the, the, that she has no horses that can ascend to the... God don't care. Here's what the Lord says. Hey, Elijah. You're not supposed to be here. Go. Get out. Here's what he says. Get out. Get out of the cave. Get out of this place. Get out of that rut. Get out of that mindset. Get out of that situation. Get out of that habit. Get out of that thought process. Get out of that pattern. Get out of it now. And he said, go out. Stand on the mount before the Lord. I love this because here's what he does. He turns the cave of comparison into a corridor of calling. <sighs> that you feel like you've been neglected. You feel like you've been rejected. You feel like the thing that God called you to, you can no longer do it anymore. But here's God. He says, in the midst of your complaining, in the midst of your crying, in the midst of your excuse, I'm still calling you. You want to give up. And somebody showed up here today and said, yep, that preacher's going to say something to me that's going to make me feel worse than I did when I came in. And the whole setup for you today is I don't care where you find yourself, what cave or what hole you found yourself lodging in. Here's what the Lord, the God of hosts, is saying to you this morning. Get out of the cave. I'm turning the cave into a corridor of calling. I'm still calling you. I'm still calling you. I still got an assignment on your life. I still got a promise on your life. I still got a purpose for your life. There's still a destiny for you. I'm still calling you. It's not over yet, Elijah. Go out to the mountain and stand before the Lord. So he goes out, and the familiar part of the text is this. He goes out onto the mountain, verse 11, and behold, the Lord passed by. Say that. The Lord passed by. Say it again. The Lord passed by. And everything that happens as a result of the Lord passing by happens next. Watch this. The Lord passes by, but the Bible doesn't say Elijah comes out the cave. Notice the text. He says, get out, Elijah. And Elijah doesn't go. The Lord passes by. Watch this. He's up Mount Horeb. Do you remember when Moses came and the Lord passed by? Moses got to see the glory of God. Don't stay in your position so long that you miss the glory of God. So here's what the Lord has to do. Watch this. The Lord passes by. Elijah misses his glory. But here's what happens. The rocks didn't. Y'all miss it. You, we always wonder, Alan, what's happening in this? Why is all these things happening in the text and God's not in it? Because the, the creation is responding to the glory of God. Watch this. God showed himself on earth and nothing could stay the same. God showed himself on earth and everything got crazy. The Lord passed by and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and said, did you not see? The Lord showed up. Did you not see? 
God was here and the mountains had to break up. There are hard places in your life that when God shows up, he'll break the rocks out of your heart and give you a new heart. The wind shows up and breaks into pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord wasn't in the wind. And after the wind came, the earth started to shake because sometimes in his presence, you just want to dance. And the, the earth did a little Harlem shake. The old school version, not the new one. The earth did a little Harlem shake and everything started to move. But the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, the fire came because the fire is representative of the spirit of God. And the fire said, if the Lord shows up, I want to act like the Lord. I want to be like the fire that's going to one day come down at Pentecost. But the Lord wasn't in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. Scientists have tried to break down the lowest particles on earth. And they said they've broken down those particles to such small things that they're not seen. But actually, the only way that they can describe it is a sound. It's because when God decided that he was going to create the world, he didn't do it through a blueprint and the hands of other people. Because when God decided to call things into being that were not there, he didn't do it through a hammer and nails. Because when God decided he was going to call something out of nothing, when God decided he was going to pull something out of an abyss that existed, he says, I'm not going to do it with, with anything except my words. And the scientists say that when you break down the particles of the earth into their smallest components, what they realize is what Genesis 1 and 1 already told you, that he's spoken into existence. That at the very core of what it is that you see is what you hear. And what he says is what holds us together. And God says that Elijah, you're not going to see me. That's the earth sacrificing. That's the earth worshiping. That's the earth doing it. I need you to pay closer attention. I think I told you this before, but I need to tell you again that in the Hebrew, watch this, it's really better translated that it was a sheer silence. This is why I say this becomes a corridor of calling because the earth shows him the rumble. And they say, we do our job. The wind and the earthquake and the fire, we do our job. The earth says, we've been doing our job, but the sheer silence is an indicator that where you don't hear or see God, is where God wants to move through you. Ooh, I got to say that again. Y'all missed it. Y'all missed it. This is heavy. This is heavy. That where you don't, this is what the Lord told me. I'm looking at everybody else's calling, the earthquakes and the movements that they're making, and I tried to repeat them. But the Lord says, no, I'm not in the wind for you. I'm not in the earthquake for you. I'm not in the fire for you. I'm in the silence. Why, Lord, are you in the silence? He says, Robert, because where there is no sound, I'm calling you to speak. He says, where there is no movement, I'm calling you to disrupt. Where there is no activity, I'm calling you to shake it up. Whenever you hear the silence of God, it's an indicator where God is getting ready to call you. They have not heard God up until this point because they have not been, because you have not been used God, used by God to speak on his behalf up to this point. So when the time comes that you hear sheer silence in an area, let me make it more practical to you. Some of you have burdens that nobody else is talking about. Some of you have visions that nobody else is talking about. Some of you have passions that everybody else is ignoring. That silence is him speaking to you. And you're looking at what's the trend. You're looking at the statistics. You're looking at the goals. And here's what God says. Where is nothing happening? Too many times, this is what we want to do. We want to, ooh, thank you, Holy Spirit. We want to hitch our ride to somebody else's momentum. We want to hitch our ride to somebody else's momentum. If it's working for them, and you want to ride their horse, and here's what the Lord says, I'm not calling you to do that. That horse will buck and trample all over you, but I need you to listen for the silence. And when you listen for the silence, you will see where God is calling you to work. He calls Elijah in the sheer silence. Now notice this. Even after Elijah hears God in the silence, he still got a tendency to complain. I'm going to end it right here. Watch what he says. In the sheer silence, the low whisper, and Elijah heard it. He wrapped his face in the cloak. Because he knew, I'm, I'm, I'm going to hide myself because if I look at God straight up, 
I might die. And he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Remember I told you he hadn't come out yet. When you hear God in the silence, I'm going to need you to move. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? God has not changed his mind. What he called you to before, he's calling you to now. What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very, (laughs) Elijah is hilarious because he said, if God going to double down, so am I. Exact same verse. Watch this. I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek to take my life away. And the Lord said to him, go. The Lord says, says, you're going to double down, I'm going to triple down. Go. But watch what the Lord says with this. This This is powerful right here. He says, go. Return on your way to the wilderness. Now he's telling him to backtrack. Go back the way that you've come. Go back to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, watch this, you shall anoint Haziel to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel. Ahab is currently king over Israel. He's running from Ahab and Jezebel. God tells him, I'm about to take care of your problem, but you got to participate. He says, you're going you're gonna to anoint, you're gonna on, anoint Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel, Meholah, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. I thought this was funny. He was like, and, and since we're having a problem with this obedience thing, I'm about to raise up somebody else. <laughs> and, and, and the one, watch this, and the one who escapes from the sword of Haziel, the king of Syria, shall Jehu put to death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. He says, I'm taking care of your problem, but you're going to have to participate. Yeah. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel to prove that I'm telling the truth and you're a liar. It's not not that God wants to prove you're a liar, but he wants to tell you. He's like, look, 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 you're not the only one. What God is saying in this moment is, I don't need you, I choose you. There's 7,000 in Israel who have not, in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed down to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. If I could boil down my sermon to one simple thing is this, you will never fully experience God's power until you fully engage in the right position. Took my dog to a ridiculously expensive training. He went to a ridiculously expensive training. He was boarded there for two weeks to learn some commands. And when he came back, he knew some commands. But the most impressive was this command that she gave him, it was place. And I started to bring his little mat here today, but it's a little, a little mat. I have a big dog. He's a big dog. He's a Rottweiler. He's 10 months old, but he's already 90 pounds, and, and he's a big dog. And so they gave him this little mat. She brought that little mat into my house, and she says, when you say place, he should go over to this place, and he should sit on this place. Now, let me give you some background. When she told me how to make him sit, she told me he has to sit pretty. It needs to look the way you want it to look. It needs to be perfect. When he's down, you don't let him sloppily lay down on one hip and lay on his side. No, you make him lay with his hind legs on the sides of both of them and his legs in the front. That's a good down. This is a good sit. She said, it needs to be perfect before you reward him. But then she said, but when he gets in his place, when, when he gets to the place, when he gets to this position, only thing you're looking for is for him to commit to being there. That all four of his paws are on place. And as soon as all four paws hit the place, you reward him. You tell him, good dog. You give him a treat. You tell him that how, how great he is. It doesn't have to be perfect. He just needs to be in position. Can I talk to somebody? today, that you will never fully experience God's power until you fully engage in the right position. He's not looking for you to be perfect. He just needs you in position. He just needs your heart, your mind, and your body to line up and say, God, wherever you're sending me, I'm committed. God, whatever you need from me, I'm committed. Listen, he says, I don't need it to be perfect. I don't need it to look exactly like everybody else wants it to look. I don't need it to be in the way that everybody else says it to look. He says, but I need you to be in position. And here's my confession, that come hella high water, no matter what it is that I go through, no matter what it is that the enemy tells me, no matter what voice he puts in my head, I'm going to stand here Sunday after Sunday in my position because this is where I'll experience the power of God. I'm going to stand in my position because when I'm in position, he'll reward me for my faithfulness. When I'm in position, he'll show me his authority. When I'm in position, he'll give me my power. You didn't see it in the text that when Elijah came out of the cave, he says, you got power to anoint kings. You got power to put to death the things that have been threatening you. You got power to take nations and transform 
transform their leadership. Elijah was a prophet to Israel, but he was getting ready to anoint the king of Syria. God says, I'm going to stretch you beyond your borders when you get in position. I don't know who you are, but when you get in position, the Red Sea is going to part. When you get in position, the fires can't burn you. Oh, you forgot that Moses had to stand in the position in front of the sea and raise up the staff before the waters parted. The three Hebrew boys had to stand in position while everybody else bowed so that the fire wouldn't burn them. Daniel had to get down in his position and pray so that the lions wouldn't eat him. Jesus had to get into position so that when he got up, he had all power, heaven and earth in his hands. If you get into position there is power in the position but God is asking you will you come out of the cave and get in position the position is not a place of cowardice as a matter of fact it's a place of confrontation the position is not a place of comparison. No, 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 it's a place of contentment. The position comes when you walk through the corridor of your calling and take a hold of everything that God has said to you. Everything that he's promised you, you grab a hold of it. Thanks for listening to this message. We hope you enjoyed it. You can also view a videotaped message on our app, My Freedom DFW, found in any app store. And remember, love free, live free, be free. Be free. Be free.